first of all, great to be with all of you. And uh, when I get to what I'm, what I'm talking about here, I hope ask any and all questions or about this subject or anything else. Uh, I love to talk about reporting. That's what I've done basically my whole life. Uh, I got very lucky early on. My first year in college, I became a reporter on the morning edition of the Kansas City Star. Um, it was a great place to start because it taught you a number of things. Uh, all the things we as young reporters see, but it also taught me uh, the sanctity of being, of accuracy, of verifying information. And it also taught me another thing, which I live with basically every week that I do any reporting, and that's the concept of never assuming, never assume anything, never assume how somebody's name is spelled. That's how it started in Kansas City. Never assume where you're going to find something, never assume uh, who will talk to you, and never assume that you even know completely everything there is to know about something. Uh, but as great as the experience was in Kansas City, it didn't teach me everything. There was one fundamental thing that uh, was left out. When I began there and you wanted to find out something, you were told basically, reach for a phone, call somebody. The idea that there might be some other way to do that just wasn't discussed, uh, wasn't even considered. And what I'm talking about, of course, to anybody who's looked at any of the work Don and I've done, I'm talking about documents, records, uh, written material of various sorts. Uh, they give you color, they give you information that you cannot otherwise find. Uh, they, give, they allow a certain amount of accuracy that very often the human mind doesn't provide for you. Uh, all of those things were extremely important. Uh, the, the book that Chris just mentioned that we've just updated, American What Went Wrong, uh, went through it and one of the anecdotal stories that we kept has very much to do with documents. It has to do with a woman who lost her job in a manufacturing plant in Northern Virginia uh, after 30 years. And we talked about her life and the fellow who'd put her out to pasture and we contrasted their lifestyles. And we made the point in the story that when she retired, which would be the next year, uh, her pension would equal half what this man who had fired her was paying for the care and feeding of the family dog. It was one of those incredible, statistics and facts that kind of symbolize the whole story. What went wrong was about the growing ranks of folks at the top, how the middle class was squeezed and more people at the bottom. And people for ages ask us, where in the world did you get something like that? Well, when Don and I have done any story, we open a lot of doors to documents. Sometimes there's nothing there. But one of the routine places we checked was divorce court. And it turned out his wife was suing him for divorce. And she said she needed a certain amount of money. And one of the documents that she submitted illustrating how much it took to run the household was this bill showing what it cost her to feed and take care of the family dog on a monthly basis. Uh, again, it ends up symbolizing almost what the whole series became. Uh, we go to documents before we go into anything else. We read them. Uh, secondary sources, primary material. We try to school ourselves in the subject before we ever go to an inter interview. Now I know having been in journalism, uh, daily journalism, many years at the beginning of my career, I know you, there's not always time to do that. I totally understand that. I'm just saying when there is time, uh, whether it's 10 minutes, an hour, a day, uh, try to school yourself in advance because it's so important. Not only does it give you more understanding of the subject. But I think the great thing is it gives you a certain amount of independence. One of the perennial issues that I think we as journalists deal with all the time when we interview somebody, we think, is this person lying to me, right? I mean, we all go through that even when they appear to be so persuasive. Well, half the time they may not be lying. Half the time anymore, they just may not know what they're talking about. I mean, we've had a society anymore where people just feel like when they're asked a question, they've got to provide an answer whether that's right or wrong. But again, this is the great thing about documents. It lets you get a leg up on that. Uh, the project that you're going to do this week, Tracing the Flow of Government, is so similar to so many things Don and I have done over the years. Our very first project was inner city housing abuses by the Federal Housing Administration, just tracing who got the money. It was supposed to be poor people, but in fact, it was appraisers, it was real estate speculators, it was mortgage companies, it was everybody who was supposed to get the money. Um, similarly, in a, in a story on the great tax giveaway, we traced 
who actually benefited from these special things that were plugged into tax legislation. How much did they get? Who were they? Uh, at the onset of the Iraqi war, the U.S. airlifted $13, $14 billion of U.S. currency to Iraq uh, just to give people walking around money, supposedly. Where did that money go? We tried to trace that money. Um, most recently, uh, for this book, that the, the update that Chris just mentioned, uh, we have a section on the Trump tax bill. And over the last couple of weeks, because the book is just out, I've done a lot of radio interviews. And the question that more interviewers have asked than anything else is there's a statistic in the book, and the statistic goes like this. In that bill, that 2017 tax bill, if you were making a million dollars or more, you received on average a $64,000 a year tax cut over the next 10 years. Uh, by contrast, if you were in the heart of the middle class, let's say making 50 to 75,000, you received on average about $800 a year. People say, where in the world, where's that from? Well, it's in black and white. It's extrapolated from the Joint Committee on Taxation report on the bill, which was filed after the legislation was passed. Uh, it's a matter of very, very simple arithmetic uh, to come up with that. So it's just a further illustration of what's in documents, what's in records. Half these things aren't secret. It's just a matter of finding them and, and, and trying to make use of them. Uh, one investigation we did, which uh, Chris alluded to, which you received the, the story on over the good billions over bad, is almost a classic example of the kind of thing I think many of you will try to look at uh, for this project. A uh, little background on this, uh, the 2008 financial crisis was second only to the Great Depression. Well, I must say what's going on right now may certainly top it uh, in terms of its impact. And it was the collapse of a big financial institution that sent shockwaves through the economy and people wondered, is the whole banking system safe? So the Treasury decided the only way uh, to shore up everybody's confidence was just to throw a lot of money into the economy and say nobody else, no other banks were going to fail. The whole system was sound. The failure of Lehman Brothers, which had precipitated that, was an aberration. Um, and as part of that, Treasury called the big banks to Washington and, and Treasury sat them down at a table and said, okay, here's, you're going to take these billions of dollars, put them into your account, and, and infuse the economy with more uh, money keep everything propped up, so forth. So our, we began this months after this happened. And the question was, where did the money go? Just a very simple thing like that. How much did this person, this bank get, and where, what did they use it for? Uh, how close to the objectives of the program uh, was this achieved? Anyway, as I said earlier, we always start with documents. We always start with reading. In this case, it turned out to be uh, a ton of reports, Inspector General reports um, from the Treasury Department explaining the program. There were many government accountability office reports as well. Uh, some of these weren't there in the beginning, but, but began to come in as we did our research. Uh, there were numerous congressional oversight uh, hearings and reports also looking at the same thing. But the most valuable uh, report for us uh, turned out to be one and Chris, can I can you flash up there on that uh, that first PDF? Uh, show people what this is. This was something called the uh, transactions report. Uh, this was issued pretty much monthly from January two thousand nineteen on until ultimately I think close to three hundred banks got the money. At the very top here, you see the top. Uh, nine big banks and what they received and the date they received them. 1028 was the date of this famous meeting of the big nine. Um, anyway, that, that's just one page. This goes on for pages after pages. Um, this turned out to be one of the great uh, uh, resources we used because it showed what everybody was getting and it gave us our prospective case studies. Uh, the big banks we knew about, but a lot of these other banks we'd never heard of. And we began to start looking at a number of them on kind of a random basis. Some of this was demographically, some of this was uh, geographically. We could see from this, you know, what these, what potential cases were. Most of what we selected were that way. For example, um, 
I'm sorry, before we did that, we also filed a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, FOI sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. The FOI in this case was to see what kinds of correspondence, what kinds of other internal documents the Treasury would, would share with us on this uh, Office of Financial Stability, which is the one issuing uh, the document that you just saw. Uh, this is one of the least used parts of Washington that I'd like to just digress on just a little bit. Every time you see in the Federal Register any agency proposing regulations, let's just say it's an uh, energy department wants to loosen the rules on fracking, or uh, IRS wants to toughen the rules for offshore bank accounts. Uh, when they do that, in, in, in the regulations, there's a number of that, of that regulation. And that agency then invites comments. Very few journalists ever look at these things. And this is actually where most things happen in Washington. And it's not on the Hill. And most of these things are in these regulations. And back in those days when I did this, you know, even just 10, 11 years ago, you had to actually go to the agency to look at these comments. Now, most of these things are online. You can go to almost any agency and you'll see the regulations and you can go and you see what somebody says about it. It's a tremendous boom to reporting versus the old days. But anyway, so I, we made an FOI request to see these at Treasury. Uh, at the same time, it turned out a nonprofit in Washington called Judicial Watch had, done, had actually done it before us and was starting to get uh, some emails back. Uh, the two together helped us flesh out a lot of what was going on in the program. When the FOI request came through for us, I went to Treasury to um, spend the day there looking through these emails. As a rule, most of them were not particularly uh, uh, exciting. Uh, there were things as simple as like, where are we going to go to lunch, of course, <laughs> some of the big issues of the day. Uh, one of them did show the room in Treasury where the nine banks were brought together by the Secretary of the Treasurer, Henry Paulson. Just a nice little physical note that you could put in the story. So it helps a reader understand that this is an actual place. But one other document that emerged from the emails was really quite spectacular. And this is the major financial institution participation commitment. When Paulson, the Secretary of Treasury, called everybody together in Treasury, these big banks, and said, okay, I'm going to, you're going to take this money and you're going to put it into the economy and so on and so forth. This particular one is from J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, signed at the bottom by Jamie Dimon, whose signature is basically not readable, but it's him. And what did Dimon etch in up there at the top? Well, he etched in, he wrote in 25 billion. Take a look at this carefully. If any of you have ever bought a car, a house, taken out any loan at all. Um, you can see how <laughs> preposterous this looks. I mean, a car loan alone is what, I don't know. We bought a car last year. It seemed like it was 25 or 30 pages. Uh, but rather than a pile of forms, Treasurer just wanted to make this so easy. So here it was. Diamond signs this, writes in 25 billion. Somebody else took 15 billion. Uh, turns it back to the Secretary of Treasury, goes back to New York, and I guess checked his bank balance that night, see how quickly it got there. But anyway, um, this was one of the, the amazing documents that did emerge um, from, the, from the emails. Once we had the names of the bank, the background of all this, we began focusing on the specific case studies. Uh, random looks uh, around the country uh, starting to pull together uh, Nexus comments, if any, if any said anything about what they were going to do with the, bank, with the money, uh, their financial reports to see if that was expanded in any detail, uh, database checks, things of that sort, both small and large ones. Uh, pick the Santa Barbara Bank, which is part of the story because um, Santa Barbara is a very, very wealthy area. Anybody who's ever seen that area. Uh, and I wonder what does a bank in Santa Barbara need uh, with money? Uh, similarly, Northern Trust in Chicago is a, an institution that only caters to the upper, upper, upper crust and presumably would have absolutely no need for any of that money. Uh, one of the most interesting interviews came from this smaller bank in, in Portland, Umpqua, 
called the president of that bank and he told the story, which is related in the, the piece that you saw. The treasurer called him, somebody from treasurer, and said that Secretary Paulson wants to send some money your way, uh, maybe as much as um, uh, 100, I think they got 180, uh, 180 million, I believe, was, on, was slated for them. And the president of the bank told me, he said, well, I told him, I said, thanks a lot, but we really don't need the money. Our bank is in good shape and we're continuing to do business as usual. Uh, but thanks for offering. Hangs up the next day, the same treasury guy calls back and says, you're going to take the money. Secretary Paulson wants you to take this money. And some banks, including this bank, were reluctant to do it because they felt by taking the money, it might send a message to their own depositors and their own business community that somehow they were in a weakened condition. But all that went out the window. You were taking the money. The next thing he told me he was worried about, it, that, oh my goodness, what am I going to have to do? They said, they said, the secretary wants your application on his desk tomorrow. So he thought, oh my, my gosh, I'm going to have to spend all night doing this application. Right then faxed over to him were two pages. So for 180 million, he just had to fill out two pages, most of which he said was white space. Um, and he got the money, I think it was the next day. All this came to symbolize for us kind of the helter-skelter nature of this program, that there really wasn't a lot of design, uh, that they really weren't trying to find banks that per perhaps needed it, that they were just pumping the money into the economy, hoping some of it would might stick somewhere and do some good. But as we went through uh, the case studies, we found out some banks just parked it because they didn't need it. Uh, other banks bought other banks. Uh, other banks like Santa Barbara used it to uh, pump some more money into, actually it's one of its predatory loan programs. Uh, so on down the line, what these banks were using this for had in many cases, nothing whatsoever with infusing capital money into the economy to keep everything rolling. Um, and that was kind of the conclusion we came to uh, really at the end of the story, that there had been no design, that there had been no oversight. And we said, is this really a way to throw $300 billion into the economy without anybody watching it in any particular careful way? Um, at the time, and in the years after that, um, politicians, both Democratic and Republican, <clears throat> said the program was a great success. All these banks paid back what they borrowed in effect. And it was a win-win situation all the way around for the country. It alleviated the crisis, so on and so forth. Well, we didn't have the benefit of this at the time, but about 10 years after that, a very resourceful professor at MIT decided to take a, take a deep look at this whole question. And she concluded that rather than this program costing nothing, which is what politicians on both sides had said afterward, it had actually cost taxpayers roughly 500 billion, not an insignificant sum, I think we'd all agree, she said part of this was uh, assistance to Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie Mac, uh, the t some hidden charges in the TARP program itself, FHA, and some of the administrative costs that she felt had never been documented. So the point being, uh, there's never a free lunch, even though it appeared that way at the time. Uh, before we get before we get to questions, let me let me just talk to you a little bit about the writing of this, the organizing of it. Uh, I found over the years people leads, you know, how you start a story. It's just one of those nagging things that we all go through. And how, how, did, how do you start a story like this? What, what do you do? And, there's, and we all know this is the great thing about journalism and writing. There's always multiple choices. I told my wife, I said, if there is a hereafter, I want to come back as an assembly line worker, putting the ninth nut on the front, right front tire of a car coming off the line. I mean, very precise, no judgment calls, <laughs> nothing to debate and discuss, just make it simple. But anyway, here's how this lead came up, which has to do with if you've had a chance to read it. 
when I went down to look at these emails of uh, people talking about the program, I went through this very heavily guarded guard station. And I went in but before I went downstairs. The reading room was downstairs in the basement of Treasure. Um, I saw open doors to this rather large room with a beautiful golden coffered ceiling. And by the way, any of you, uh, there's a rule in Washington, the older the building is usually the nicer, the more beautiful the building. And Treasury is one of the very, very oldest buildings in all of Washington, early 1800s, I believe, I don't know the exact date. Uh, but anything built in recent years as a rule is quite ugly, quite pedestrian. But anyway, I looked at this room and I said, wow, this is, so I went anyway, went, did my emails. When I came back out, I looked at, there's a little plaque there. It said, the cash room. So I made a note of it. When I got back to the office, my office, I looked, I looked this up and it turned out the cash room had this glorious history. There was actually a place all through the 19th century where the public could come in and see business of government being uh, transacted. Contractors came in to get paid. Uh, in the 1870s, money actually arrived by a horse-drawn cart. Uh, banks exchanged old bills for new bills, uh, this whole range of things. But the point being, the public could actually see what was going on. And I just thought it was kind of a nice uh, example of how things had changed. And now nobody was looking at the money. Nobody had any idea what was going on in contrast to the past. Uh, but again, one of those things that would never have occurred to me if I hadn't gone there simply um, to look at to look at uh, the emails. The process we used in TARP, very, very similar to what we've used over the years. Again, the reading first, and then zeroing in on what those case studies are. Uh, the biggest question I think we all face is how to keep track of information, right? I mean, I think we all, the deeper we get into a story, uh, the more information we have and the more chance of forgetting something. Uh, I've never found any fail-safe way to do this other than one way, and nobody likes to hear this, other than just jotting down themes here and there that emerge when you're doing your work, which we all do. I found the only thing that you can really do with a story that has some substance to it is to go back and reread your own material, reread the reports you've collected, reread the interviews you've done. Um, because what sometimes is in an early interview or report may have no significance to you at all because you don't know what it means. But days afterward, when something else comes along that you see, that you now understand, you go, voila. Now, when you've read it that second time, then it has a significance. I've often been amazed at myself over the years. I'll go back and read something and I'll say, how in the world did I not see that in the beginning? That very, very significant point. Uh, so I find rereading, which is terribly boring, uh, but very, very productive to be one of the most important things that you can do. The second thing is, uh, and this is part of the process that has changed a little bit, I, I tend to write as I go along now in a way I didn't when I was much younger, uh, on the theory that whatever you've written is going to have to be rewritten anyway to some extent. I mean, that's true of all of us in all times. So I, I just get something out. I think it's wonderful for the, uh, your mental health, plus you see what you're missing. In some cases, you find out you're not missing anything once you write one of these things. Uh, the biggest thing that's changed, and uh, this is what I really want to leave you with, and this is just a statement on what a, for all the craziness, what a great time we're in. When Don and I did the first What Went Wrong, that you know, Chris was holding up the two books earlier, uh, there was a lot of tax data, corporations, individuals. Uh, that information was extracted from paper files at the government documents room in Philadelphia and then entered in spreadsheets and then we analyzed that. I didn't leave my desk or any of the, ta the tables, the statistics that you see in the new book. All those IRS statistics are online. Bureau of Census, Bureau of Economic Analysis data is all online. The amount of information that is online now where it is tables that can be downloaded and then um, tabulate is just astonishing. 
So what used to take days and weeks um, can now take hours. And I, the whole time that we were redoing this book, uh, updating it, that incredible point kept coming home about how long it had taken to show how the corporate, uh, the deduction the corporations take for interest on corporate debt. One of their great benefits, which the average person has no knowledge of, it took us forever to get those reports over time and then to input them and then to analyze them. Now, very easy, all that's available, IRS. Uh, that's why uh, as crazy as journalism is and as wonderful as it is, uh, this is why to me, for all its problems, this is the golden age part of it and uh, make use of it the best you can. So anyway, I, I think, why don't we, we got about almost a half an hour left. Uh, any questions uh, about any and all things? Um, yeah, so if anybody has questions, just um, you can either put them into chat or, or shout them out. Jim, I've got one for you. Um, thank you for your time and your thoughts as well. I'm, I'm interested in some of the great documents you showed us here today. You mentioned that you used the Freedom of Information Act for in order to ask for internal correspondence. What um, what are your FOIAs like? Do you recall what your your FOIA was? How simple or how complex was it? The the ones that were getting the the actual correspondence. That's a really great question, and I'll give you. Uh, generally, we try to keep those as simple as possible. And in fact, uh, IRE on the IRE website. Uh, somewhere in its whole FOI section. I think they even have a model letter that's pretty good that cites the statute and so forth. Well, we found with FOI and with other requests where it doesn't even go through FOI, uh, what government agencies at both the federal and state level very often try to do, they want you to be super specific sometimes over something that you can't be specific about because you may not know exactly what that thing is called but you know what you want. So the, the closer you stick to what you want and explain that, I think it's better. And we've had good luck with FOIs. We've had bad luck with FOIs. I'll tell you a quick story. When we, uh, the story I mentioned on the airlift of the, the money to Iraq, an FOI request was uh, submitted to the Pentagon for the name of the contractor who was allegedly overseeing how the money was being spent or distributed once it got to Iraq. Well, it took forever, but eventually they sent back the contract. It was very short. It was like two or three pages, believe it or not. And they'd redacted a lot of things. They'd redacted the name of the contractors, his personal name, uh, much of his phone number, but not all. Uh, some other things they had redacted. They left enough of the phone number in that you could figure out it was San Diego County. And from that, that it was La Jolla and then because they left the name of the company there. We could check it from that. But you know what they left in this FOI? I, I still can't get over it to this day. My only, they redacted so much stuff. I, I keep thinking they ran out of black ink or something <laughs> because they left the mailing address of this Pentagon contractor in this thing they sent us. And you know what it was? A post office box in the Bahamas. <laughs> Which later turns out to have been the locus of this like gigantic offshore tax scheme. Too, too long to get in here. But anyway, so I think the, the closer you can just, exp if you know exactly what you want, great. But usually you don't in terms of the, the specific name. But the closer you can describe what you want, uh, the better off you're going to be. And, and try not to play their game about exactly what it's ca called, as long as you tell them what you want. Uh, it's a back and forth. Some agencies are better than others. I've had bad luck with some agencies, good luck with others. So it's just one of those things you try and hope for the best. Okay, I got a couple uh, chat questions that came in here. I'll just read these to you, Jim. Sure. Uh, from Tyler Bridges in New Orleans. Um, I report from New Orleans and will want to write Louisiana-centric stories. Do you have initial story ideas from what you know about the PPP program? I must confess, I don't know much about this program. Uh, I still live in Philadelphia, and the Philadelphia Inquirer has actually done um, some pretty good work on this just in about the last week or 10 days. 
So I would urge somebody to take a look at that. They've, they've obtained the documents pertaining to that area and they've been going out talking to people and they found uh, that in many cases, uh, places that have said they've got $500,000 never received a penny. So the information is there and I'm not sure exactly through what office it goes, but it's just, it's starting to, to be released now. So I think that's the first thing, just find out who got it in your area and then start almost like I was describing what we did with uh, uh, the TARP program and then just start seeing who they are and find out how much they got, how much trouble it was, whether they got it at all, or whether they got more than it says they got. So uh, I think this program is not unlike the TARP program in that it's a lot of money is being thrown up against the wall and they're hoping some of it will stick. But I think already there's just a lot of mistakes in this thing based on what I've seen in my hometown newspaper. Okay. Um, we have Aldo from the Denver Post. Uh, hearing Paulson and Bernanke speak a few years after the crisis, they claim we were on the verge of financial collapse. How close do you think the system was to failing? I'm not the best one to answer that. Uh, I think if they, if you take the program where they, they, they put the money out as basically a public relations gesture to assure people that uh, uh, we're going to take care of the country and it really didn't make any difference what the money was spent for, I suppose you could say, yes, then it served that purpose. I think the point we came to at the end of it, though, was isn't it kind of dangerous to just be doing this really with no oversight? And there really was no oversight. And what sense does it make to give it to a bunch of places that, that don't even need it? I'm sure there were some banks here and there who did need it. But we, we never could find one that really needed it. Uh, I mean, Lehman Brothers, which had crashed, was the one that provoked the whole uh, 2008 crisis. So I think rather than it may well have had that important public relations effect, but at the same time you're gonna do that, you really should have some oversight, and there really was none. Okay. I, I, I kind of have a question. I mean, you said you started the, the Vanity Fair TARP story, you know, a few months after or into the TARP, uh, the, the TARP program. You know, by that time, you know, the big papers and most papers have been writing about it. I mean, we're in a crisis, but like, like now, people are writing about PPP program on a regular basis. Um, how do you, you know, how do you get your head around something that people have been writing about on kind of on a daily basis? And how do you kind of find the thing that is going to make your story distinctive when there's been so much coverage of it in the previous months? That's a great question. And I, we face that on, I would say, almost the majority of stories we wrote over the years. And, uh, Let's just take the tax giveaway story that had to do with, this is a story where a lot of you were <laughs> not just in journalism, but probably around. But anyway, the point when uh, Congress, in passing a big tax reform bill, inserted into it uh, special interest provisions benefiting individual taxpayers. At the same time, they were claiming, this is a wonderful bill that is going to clean up tax shelters and make the tax code fairer for everybody. And I'll never forget reading it. Uh, in those days, you had to read everything. You couldn't search these things. It wasn't online. Uh, after this whole section where they had, they were repealing these horrendous tax shelters down on the Caribbean. At the end of this, it said, exception, uh, such above this repeal shall not apply to a company incorporated in Delaware. On or about March 3rd, 1981, it owns one or more office buildings in U.S. St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Oh, by the way, if any of you ever have any trouble sleeping, just download about 10 pages of tax law. You're out. It's non-toxic. <laughs> Always works. But anyway, I was almost out that night till I came across this. But here's the point to answer your question, Chris. A lot of newspapers had written about some special interest provisions. But the impression of a lot of these things was that it was just one here, two there, three here. We came back and we found one more outrageous ones to begin with. And two, we showed they were directly against 
uh, the exalted language of the bill. And I think it was the magnitude of these that then really got people. They realized that what they'd read previously here or there was not just an exception, that this thing was laced with these things. So in almost every case, you try to advance the story, you try to find better examples, or you try to tie it into broader themes that are going on. And that's what we did with TARP. I mean, we tried to show, uh, the whole idea of this was to shore up the, the, the economy. But none of these banks were engaged in any of that. And there was no oversight of, of it in general. So that's something in almost every, and the same thing happened with the, the, the billions of dollars airlifted to Iraq. There had been a couple of stories about this out of Congress because somebody had raised a question about it and then it went away. So we just came back and said, okay, let's see if we can trace the money from start to finish. And that's what, that, was what, that was the architecture of the story. It, the money left from the Federal Reserve Bank's warehouse in East Rutherford, goes to Andrews Air Force Base, goes to Iraq, gets lost. People watch out for it, don't watch out for it. Uh, to this day, nobody's found about 75% of that money. We only had limited success in, in nailing down some of it. So there's always more there. You just have to advance the story. It can be the example. It can be to tie it into a larger picture, uh, something that shows it wasn't just a fluke. So it, it can be done, but it, it, it takes kind of an extra effort. Okay. Um, Kelsey Landis from the Belleville News Democrat, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Did we skip a question from Ben Marcus about Oh, I'll, I'll get back to him. I was just kind of okay. working in, in, working in um, audio ones and check, chat ones. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, yesterday we heard from a speaker who said that Congress had to move really quickly to get the money, at, you know, as far as PPP and other coronavirus stimulus money, they needed to move it quickly to get it out there to, to help people. And with the full knowledge that the oversight was limited and that, you know, a lot of it just wouldn't stick to actually help people. But you know, she also suggested that the next round of coronavirus coronavirus stimulus money would um, perhaps be more targeted with more oversight. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts on that view are and, you know, what's the trade-off of getting money out there fast when people need it and, in, and then also, you know, the lack of oversight. Well, this one is a little, this one is quite different in some ways than TARP because a lot of this money is actually going to people or small businesses. I mean, the PPE is, what is it? It's businesses under 500 employees, I believe is the, uh, what it's about. So, you know, this is more human in that sense and you may end up with more, more mistakes. And like I said, I really recommend the Philadelphia piece. Uh, look that up it's about a week ago. The other thing may be when the next round comes out uh, to do that comparison, is it, is it really functioning better? Have they learned anything from the first time around? Also, I'm looking at the Philadelphia piece that I was telling you about. Uh, I wonder how widespread that is. If the stories I saw in the Enquirer are going on in every, every place, I mean, this thing must be a kind of a disaster. I mean, you, there are people who said they're supposedly got money, got no money. Others was told they're gonna get money, it still hasn't come. Uh, once again, it's the case studies. I'd look at those, see what's going on there, and if the next round, do the same thing. See, see who's getting, and compare the, uh, the operation. It, you know, what's the agency that's, that's, I know it's Small Business Administration that's doing this, and I, I still haven't even seen the story about what they've done internally to do this. Maybe somebody's written about it, but I would be curious about that. Have they had to hire? Are they limping along with the kind of, uh, staff they have. I mean, the whole thrust of so much government over the last 40 years has been to reduce government employment. And agency after agency has fallen victim to this idea that government is evil and therefore we don't have people. So I would be interested to see exactly what what's happening in something like that. What are they going through? So. Okay. Uh, uh, ben Marcus from Colorado Public Radio. I'm new to investigative journalism from Daily News. Your projects are big, all caps. 
How do you maintain excitement for the work over months or maybe years? Well, this is a, this is a good question. Uh, uh, and a lot of people think they want to do investigative work and they do it once and that's it because uh, there's, it's a different, it's a different bit of timing. And I have to say my earlier projects were not as long as, as many of the later ones. Uh, so it was kind of a build up to that. And then of course, books are yet one on top of that. Books require a totally different kind of thing. I think you just have to keep your eye on what's ahead of you and uh, always try to be productive. That's why that's what I said about writing as you go along. Uh, what you're writing may have to be rewritten. You may find some information later that'll change the whole picture of that, but get it out because a lot of it is going to be valid and important one way or another. And most of it is something that you probably just have to rewrite. So I, I've always kept um, my eye on this because once you find a couple or three things that are really good, that's enough to tell you that this is going to be okay. They're going to be barren pot, p patches where uh, things aren't happening. And that's the nature of the beast. I think that's the hardest thing for people doing shorter range things versus long range things if they're not used to it. Because shorter range things, the dry patches are very short as a rule. And you find something else or you just can't find it and you got to get the story out and it's done. Uh, but there are these deserts that you, you pass through with a big project. But you just have to assume that it will work. And what I try to do when that happens is then I will go to something that I know is going to be written and at least try to get that out so that it's kind of good for the mental health. You feel you're not, you're not uh, spinning your wheels. Uh, but I, at this point, I guess I've had the advantage of doing it for a long time. And in the beginning though, uh, I mean, I, w I was in daily journalism in Kansas city and probably never had more, and um, maybe two weeks on the story. Maybe if there was one, I might've had three weeks, but that was really rare. I mean, most of the time I was just pounding away daily stuff all the time. So I had to slowly build up to this, but it was my frustration over some of the daily stuff that actually fired my interest in enterprise long range stuff. I just felt like I'm not telling this full story. What will it take to really uh, be able to say that. So that, that, that was the trigger for me that led me into this. Okay. Um, Michelle Smith from the AP in Providence. In addition to the documents that you used, did you use any sources to point you to especially egregious cases of banks getting money or was it all done through documents and sorting through the data and reports you had? In this particular story, we didn't, uh, didn't use any sources. Uh, and Don and I, and I thought that's, I'm glad you asked this question though, because as much as I've talked about documents and records, I really want to emphasize that they do not replace interviews with, with us. They are a supplement and they always have been. Uh, they're just information that, in, that gives you, inf it gives you information that makes the interview better. So in that sense, in this particular one, there were no sources. Um, in the past on certain tax issues, we, I, Don, I know some tax lawyers who sometimes will run things by them to say, does this make sense? Uh, I did a big project for uh, Reveal about three years ago on the student loan crisis. And one of the things that I did, like if you look at all the student loan stuff, one of the significant things that happens, this happened is that the states are not supporting student loans to the degree they want the student, I mean education, they're not funding public education the way they used to uh, in terms of the percentage of what things cost. So I was very curious about, I wonder what kinds of numbers are we talking about? So I was able to find a Bureau of Economic Analysis, a series of tables that I was able to put together on an Excel spreadsheet. And I was able to come up with a statistic that if from, if, States have been supporting public education at the rate they were in 1980. 
uh, they would have contributed somewhere between 500 billion, 600 billion toward education, public higher education. We'd still have a student loan crisis, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as much as that. I called a lot of people on that one because the number just seemed so outrageous. I said, what am I missing here? What's, what's gone here? I mean, people made the point, well, Medicare has gone up. That's taken a lot of money out of states that they, they don't have to spend anymore, which you factored into the story. But so I try to find experts in these fields um, to look at things like that when the numbers seem so amazing. It's not always to quote, it's just to see, am I on the right track? If I, if I miss some fundamental bit of numbers crunching here, that's a big mistake that I don't know about. So I do, so we look, use those more than sources per se. One of the, Don and I have used very few sources, quoted very few sources over the years. One of the very few was in uh, that story on the, the billions airlifted to Iraq, because I found a soldier who had actually received some, not, he didn't receive it, but had been part of taking care of the money once it arrived in Iraq. And he was still in the army and he was very open. And I felt, I don't want to quote this guy by name <laughs> because that's going to get him in all kinds of trouble. It's unnecessary trouble. But in general, we've tried to avoid that where you could because the public seems to be increasingly, increasingly uh, skeptical unless the name is attached to somebody. Can't do it all the time, but every time you can, try to do it. And every time we found a source who told us something volatile like that, we've tried to go out and find a way, can we nail that idea down somewhere else and put it in the story? Okay, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, uh, Julie uh, Carr Smythe from the AP in Columbus, Ohio, you can unmute yourself and ask. Hello, um, very honored to meet you. Uh, I just had a question follow up on your writing uh, comment. You said you try to get it out and do you mean get it out on in publish it or do you mean get it out of your system like each of these separate sections that you've been working on? More uh, the latter. Yes, more the latter. Okay. Uh, so you write it in chunks and then you put it all together later? Yeah, the long pieces like when Don and I were at the Inquirer and, and Time Magazine, where we did classic multi-part series, one of us would usually write one part, kick it over to the other, uh, who, might, who would have some ideas. Uh, and then we would sort of jointly usually write the, over, the, the main piece, you know, parts of it and so forth. And, and at Vanity Fair, where everything has been like a one-shot thing, we've, we've each sort of written parts of things. And what happens is when you start your reporting, as you all know, uh, themes will emerge. You'll see something that you that interests you. You'll follow that theme. When there are two of you, two of us, the same thing happens. He would see different things than I would see. Sometimes they would they would be similar, and uh, I I might write something uh, and say, "What do you think of this?" And he'd look at it and say, "This is great, but I I've, I've got this memo over here. It fits perfectly with this. We plug it in." So it was that kind of a collaborative thing before we ever showed it to, to editors. But by getting it out, I just meant. Uh, writing is hard enough to begin with. Uh, everything you write is going to have to be rewritten anyway by yourself to get it in the shape you really want it. You will learn more things as you go along that can enrich that piece. I've just found the more you can set something aside, and I, and I mean this, whether it's 10 minutes, an hour, a day, a week, it will be better because you'll see things to polish it, to clean it up, uh, other things will occur to you, and when they do occur, you think, why in the world didn't I think of that to begin with? But that seems to be the way the human mind, that just kind of like a muscle works. So that's what I mean by getting it out, right? It's my, and that's totally different than it was when I was young. I used to, I just, I'd save, save everything up. Even the early series Don and I did, we'd save everything up and sit down with this stuff and try to churn it out. Uh, not really the most efficient way of going about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I got a question from Emily Munson of Hearst Washington Bureau. One part of Good Billions After Bad that struck me was that Treasury hired a private contractor that was also one of the big nine to keep track of the money as it was being dispersed. How often is the government hiring private contractors to oversee its bailout programs and funds in addition to its own watchdogs? And how uh, do we find out about these private overseers? 
that's that's a great question because they did it with this, and of course, the one that I mentioned earlier on on Iraq was probably the most. Uh, if anybody, well, it's on the website. That's on Donar's website. Uh, the billions over Baghdad. Uh, that's a classic case of that of the government hiring a, a contractor to oversee things, and this goes on all the time. I, I think. Uh, I'm not exactly sure in the case of something like PPP, uh, if whether they have that or not. I would start, frankly, with the uh, the Inspector General of the agency. I mean, I, all of these agents, and of course, the, the IGs have risen to the fore in, in the last few months because of the way Trump's fired two or three of them. Uh, but they are, in most of these agencies, a great office that have a lot of independence. And they will not tell you certain things, but they, they should be able to tell you if you ask their PR person, are you guys watching this or is there an independent contractor doing this for you? Because the IGs in many cases, that's one of their responsibilities. They, they're supposed to, to follow the money and follow the overall performance of that agency. Uh, and that's what's kind of egregious about the way some of these guys have been uh, fired in recent months. I mean, but prior to this, there's been, if if you were of one party and an IG in that agency somehow or another lambasted something you liked, you were unhappy with it, but you generally accepted the fact that these IGs were independent. I mean, that's the whole concept of it. You're going to have people, a policeman, looking at stuff. Um, they shouldn't have any political interference. Okay. But that, I yeah, think but one place to start. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, just uh, FYI, tomorrow's first speaker is going to be um, Danielle Bryan, the executive director of ah, the Project on Government Oversight, who's yeah. going to be talking specifically about the IGs and other oversight mechanisms in place specifically for COVID money. Right. Um, so this, we're going to go, we'll, we'll go a couple minutes over to get one final question here. This is from uh, Sarah Kalinowski of ABC News. Uh, news cycles are shorter and shorter, and so much oxygen is reporting on politics and government. Uh, so much oxygen in reporting on politics and government is taken up by the tweet du jour. I know you expressed some frustration with daily coverage that motivated you to do enterprise work. Do you have concern overall that newsrooms across the country do not give the resources and the time necessary to these types of long-term investigations? And what's your overall critique of the state of longer term or long, longer form investigative reporting? 30 seconds or less. Thank you very much. Or as much time as you want. Uh, Great question, and it, I'm not an expert in this other than the fact that I do judge some contests from time to time, which I find to be a wonderful way to stay in touch with the country as a whole. I mean, that's the first thing about the U.S. The U.S. is such a big country, and it's a mixed bag. Uh, papers that never used to do investigative, some of them do it now. Others that were famous investigative papers are doing nothing. So. In many places, there's there's actually some pretty good investigative stuff or enterprise journalism going on. But again, uh, a mixed bag. You sort of have to look at it. But on the other hand, to me, the thing one of the things I'm really worried about is what's happening to the beats, uh, city hall beats, county courthouse beats, all across the country. These were so pivotal toward seeing what was happening in government. To know the, the assistant director of public works, the guy who told you uh, the boss did this last week and that's not right, or something like that. Or look what we got here. Look, the only way you do those things is to cultivate those, those places. I mean, I covered suburban districts outside Kansas City my first few years there. And you got to know everybody. You got to know the police, you got to know the school superintendent and his secretary and all down the line, it was that process where you cultivated it, and when something happened, they would usually let you in on it, assuming you wouldn't blow the whistle on them. Uh, I'm, as, I'm more worried about the beats in some ways than anything, because those were where you heard about things. Maybe the beat writer didn't do the story, but he passed it on or she passed it on to somebody who could. And uh, I think that, that is a concern. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the nonprofit sites at both the national level and uh, the, the local level are picking up some of the slack. And uh, I mean, there's a really outstanding one in San Diego. There, there's 
several, many other parts of the country. Um, my old home paper is in the enviable position of being owned by a foundation. So it doesn't have any debt service. It doesn't actually have to make a profit, just as opposed to lose any money, which is sometimes a challenge anymore. Um, so I think like all of us, I'm, I'm quite worried about this. Uh, and I think, unfortunately what we're going through right now is uh, will probably be very very difficult for a number of places uh, what i do know though the only thing i'll know based on my teaching of, and talking to folks like all of you uh, journalism's a calling and somehow or another i think enough of us are going to figure out a way to make sure these stories get told i can't tell you exactly how that's going to happen i can't tell you the vehicles that's going to that are going to be there to, to do all of these things but it's a it's a burning issue uh, not just for the public uh but for the people who do this work and it always has been so in that sense uh, i have hope i just can't tell you the exact direction that all of it will take but i know the will is there it's all the way down to kids in college who i talk with uh, and that's a very good thing to see so in that sense, uh, I have hope. Um, I just don't have any specifics.